foot. There's another one like that. It's called King Saul. You can't say that because he failed. He didn't know God. Everybody knows that he knew God. The scripture tells you what happened. He was working in the field. The enemy comes and gives some grief to his people, the Israelites, and they embarrassed them really bad, and they threatened them really bad too. And as soon as the news reached King Saul, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost came upon that man, and he got extremely angry. God hates injustice, and it was absolutely ridiculous what they were trying to do to his people. And he got angry. <laughs> people said that the Holy Ghost is not in the Old Testament. I'm like, who do you think created the world? <laughs> The Bible says that the hover, it hovered over the deep, the face of the deep. The Holy Ghost has always been there. People have always known something of the Spirit of God. It's in a different way in the New Testament, but it's the, the way he operates is different in the New Testament. Because it's a different covenant altogether, but the Holy Ghost was there. It was on him. He knew God. But he drifted away. And the kingdom of God was torn from his hands. Why? Because he didn't obey. He was trained to disobey God. He was believing something that was teaching him that it's okay to disobey God because people are out there looking at me and they want to see something different than what God's telling me to do. He got so drifted that even the prophet's clear words in his own language, he wouldn't obey. And the kingdom was torn out of his hand. He tore the cloak of Samuel the prophet. And he was full of demons at that point. And how did he react when he saw reality? How did King Saul react when he saw reality in that, that young harp player who knew God, who was playing real worship? He was, he was playing such real heavenly music that it was enough to calm his own demons down. He knew reality, but he still wouldn't knock it off. He got too far in what he was doing. The higher you up, the more, the more trouble you get into. You know what I'm saying? It says don't desire to be masters. Don't, be, don't desire to be actual apostles like Paul was. He said, we're masters. There's a greater condemnation on us. This guy had a lot of condemnation on him because he knew what he was doing. But the fear of man and the love of gain got in the way of this man. And he got so deeply rooted that when he, even when he fell off the track and he saw reality, he saw real worship, a man after God's own heart, he saw the truth. And instead of saying, praise God, bring me back to the true path, he pulled a javelin out and tried to kill him with it. It all depends on what you pick up when you're off the track. A sober man is going to have a much, a much different opinion. A sober man is going to have a very, very different opinion, okay? He's going to say, Lord, I've picked up a thousand things of absolute foolishness off the track. I've connected my heart and joined my soul with a thousand filthy, wicked, worthless things. Even the things that are lawful, they're still not profitable for what you want in my life. I know it's not true, and I don't feel your reality in my life anymore. And I'm concerned about that, Lord. Whatever you say, I will jump through every hoop that you want me to. I don't care how dumb I look. I don't care what I have to lose to get it. Lord, I'm going to trash it all. I'll throw it as far from the east as to the west. If you can save my soul, if you can get me back on track, Lord, that's how bad I want it. He says that's exactly what it's going to cost for the rest of your life. David messed up, but he sure did. He got beat after that for it too because he said, I want truth. And he agreed with truth. People get off track, but they don't always want to agree with truth when the truth has come back again. There's going to be a lot of people in the house of God today, especially the older group, especially the older people, probably 50 and above. If they were able to hear the old preaching again, they would say, that sounds familiar, like an old dream I used to have. That's, that's right. And then they look at all the hoopla and all the masses of people around them, <sighs> praising them for being this accepting, tolerant kind of Christianity. Ah, cheer, come on. Fear of man. I can't discourage all these people. But you can discourage and hurt God. You can offend the host of heaven, but you, can, you don't want to offend these people who don't even know truth. You can see that snare. Any kind of ism that comes along and tries to get you to stop obeying Christ is of Satan. It is absolutely the exact contrast to what leads to heaven. Your feet are not on the right side of grace. Your feet are on the right side of grace. The Bible says this about salvation. It says this about faith. 
It is God's grace and it is our faith in Christ, the finished works of the cross, absolutely, positively. But didn't James say something really interesting? He said, faith without works is dead. Did you know that? Did you know the Bible preaches works salvation more than it preaches free? Did I just make people mad or what? <laughs> Did I just raise your eyebrows? I'm telling you what Jesus preached himself. He said to count the cost. There are steps required. And guess what? He said salvation came to your house, to Zacchaeus. It was after he said, I'm going to put my faith into action. Your Holy Spirit preceding the Son of Man before me. The Lamb of God is right before me. I feel the presence of God and he's showing me something where I'm dead wrong. I'll give back fourfold. Salvation has come to your house now. Why? Because you wanted to put your faith into action. Who was the one preceding Jesus? Called John the Baptist. And everybody said, what should we do to be saved? He didn't just say believe. You know what he said? He said, you, you have two coats, give one to someone who doesn't have them. And you, you do this. You do that. He never said once, believe only. Never. That's only in the scripture one single time. But it screams, get busy, get busy, get busy, because if you're going to be a lazy servant, you're not going to heaven. Who was the one following that? Jesus, our blessed King. He's called Peter. Pentecostal Peter. True Pentecostal. Because he had the true spirit. And he got busy. And they said, what must we do to be saved? He said two things. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. And then you'll get the gift of the Holy Spirit. You guys hearing me? Real ministry is like this, like Paris says. He says it's to afflict the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted, okay? Make sure you see this portrait. It's very important that you understand why sometimes it's only believe and sometimes it's get busy. Because he says you're already comfortable. you got everything you want. In the natural, everything's all in a row. you got your home life okay, your family life is okay, your job, your income, and your travels, everything's all right. You're all good. You're above the mark right now in the natural. I'm coming to afflict you to say get busy and help those who don't have any. He says pure religion is to visit those in affliction, in their affliction, to visit the widow and to visit the orphan, to take care of people who can't take care of themselves. It's a gospel of getting busy if you have the strength to help others. It's a lot about it. It's a lot about the gospel, visiting those in prison says, you didn't visit me in prison, so you're not going to heaven. There's action to be taken among the true Christians. The true redeemed people are active in the faith. Christ revealed to his people. So they know. They know. They have a discernment that came from God. Not everybody has that. That's why I'm fighting so hard to make sure we don't lose something that can't be lost if we stay not lost. Get our name blotted out of that book.